to Retro Retro Enjoy your voyage. Voyage. Howdy and welcome to Retro Groove. I'm Adam. And I'm Liam. And this is a podcast where we talk about music that stands the test of time, the albums and artists that have shaped and reshaped the sonic landscape, as well as covering new music from those artists. Welcome to episode 24. It's hard to believe we're getting pretty high up in the double digits now. It's real. Um, it's, it's real. We're still trucking along. Uh, we're a real podcast. It's, we're, we're a real podcast now. <laughs> um, anybody can do 20 episodes, but 24, that's, right. yeah. that's, <laughs> that's the mark of a real, a real podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Liam, what's been going on with you? We got, we had kind of a crazy few weeks going on here. Yeah, I uh, I've been I did a lot of bowling lately. I don't know if you've oh. been bowling at all, but that's no. like a thing. All of a sudden, my my kid is seven, and she's had a bunch of birthday party play date kind of things happen. So we've been bowling three times in the past like two weeks. Wow, that's uh, a lot I'm, of bowling in two weeks. Yeah, I'm very <laughs> I'm very not good at bowling, but luckily I'm better than seven year olds. So I'm still <laughs> I'm still impressive still the enough. King. <laughs> yeah, but like when we get to nine or ten years old, I'm gonna look real silly unless oh, I get some practice rough. in. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to sneak off and get some practice in. Um, but no, it, it's been fun. Like there's a little arcade at those things, and yeah. so we go jam on those and get some tickets. And it's a scam, but it's super fun always. And uh, and they play a lot of like top forty radio songs, but um, always. My daughter knows a bunch of those, so she she digs it. So she like she heard the Harry, new Harry Styles song come on, and she was like, "Oh my god, I love this song!" And I was like, nice. "Okay, we're we're doing this." We'll like, st- it's funny because like the other kids, I don't know what they're listening to in the car. Maybe I shouldn't be putting <laughs> pop radio on in the car, <laughs> but like I don't. It doesn't seem like they it resonates at all yet. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, we'll be. How about you? Um, well, I mean, I haven't done any bowling. Oh, not, that's too bad, dude. <laughs> not even Nintendo Switch bowling? No, I haven't. Uh, no. It, it's, I don't know. I haven't been bowling post-pandemic, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I used to be, back in New England, mm-hmm. a lifetime ago, I used to be really good at, like, the candlestick bowling. What's that? And it's like, it's just kind of... It's different. It's like a smaller ball and the pins are like more like cylindrical than like the like bottom heavy normal what you would. Yeah, it's just kind of a different style. I don't know. It's, <laughs> Where were you doing this weird bowling? This is I maybe it's a New England thing. I don't know. I, it's, I guess it's called candlestick bowling. It's still bowling. Like the rules are pretty much it the looks same. I think pretty Canadian, dude. Is it Canadian? It could. This be. is looking fairly Canadian. Oh yeah, it says Can- Canada's maritime regions and New England. Okay, so it's a regional sense. thing. Yeah, I have never heard of this or seen this at all. <laughs> that ball is so tiny. It's oh a small. Gosh. Yeah, it's like kind of, almost like a bocce ball kind of thing. Yeah, it looks like a softball. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty wow. small. It's like grapefruit sized. So. I used to be pretty good at that, like as a teenager up in New England, and then, you know, moved down to Texas, and I couldn't handle like the the larger ball with the the weird pins, which is like, that's quintessential like American Mm -hmm. bowling. So, you know, you would think that I would have gotten used to it, but I never, never quite got used to it. I think I bowled a 200 once in my life, and uh, that's about as good as I've gotten at the traditional bowling. Yeah. Um, but instead of bowling the past couple of weeks, I've just been recovering from my second round of COVID. Oh, crazy, um, dude. Really, really ridiculous at this point. Um, the The actual like you know illness period, those first mm-hmm. few days when you're actually sick, were not as bad. 
but this time I've got the residual like l- loss of smell, loss of Ugh. taste, which is com- has completely destroyed my appetite because I don't really care to eat anything. I just kind of have to for fuel. So it's all sure. let's just something with a good texture. That's all I care about. Texture's big, right? Texture's, like that's it's a, all yeah, I have and now right that's now. all you have. <laughs> It's crazy. As I never, <laughs> like I've read about it and I've heard from people that it happened to them, but it's like, you really can't prepare for it. It's like yeah. you lose your will to live to, <laughs> at least for an Italian and someone yeah. that's in love with strong flavors like barbecue and Tex-Mex and spicy yeah. stuff. I mean, like if I eat something spicy, I can feel the heat, but it's just, I can't taste it really. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of starting to get it back. It's coming back slowly. I can start, I can taste sweet stuff now, but like other flavors haven't come back, but like sweetness I can taste now. Wow. So it's interesting. <clears throat> Are you, did you try to eat anything that you normally wouldn't eat? Cause you're like, well, maybe I can uh, fe- learn how to eat mushrooms <laughs> Sneak this during in. all of this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, I, I haven't had zucchini. much of an appetite. Just trying to, okay. you know, well, I better have a sandwich just so I don't pass out from lack yeah. of nourishment. Yeah, good um, call. The other weird thing's been the brain fog. Like mm. I'm, I'm seriously forgetful. Like the short term memory is just like really weirdly not present, and it's makes makes working a little bit tough. Makes yeah. um, multitasking very very tough. Yeah, it's scary. Um, yeah, it's just weird. It's 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 slowly coming back, but it's just kind of strange. It's like coming out of being sick, but like very very slowly. Yeah. So it's just strange. But <clears throat> happy to be on the mend and getting back to normal. And it's just uh, once again been pushing off my uh, return to live music, which has yeah. been such an enormous part of my life for the vast majority of my life. And it's just still to this point, you know, I get I, I find myself getting envious of people like you and other folks that have been a few times and are kind of back at it. Um, cause my, my normal routine is like, I'm usually going to see something at least once every month or two. Yeah. Um, and now it's, I just still haven't yet. Um, still got my weird owl tickets for October. <laughs> so worst case scenario, yeah. I got that. And then one of, one of my good, good friends, Max, he just texted me a couple days ago and he was like, dude, and I guess like there's a big like Smashing Pumpkins and Jane's Addiction tour that they're yeah, doing. Yeah, the announced. So yeah. <clears throat> that that's that he he really wants to do that. So that's a possibility. I personally have never been a huge like Jane's Addiction fan, um, mm-hmm. but huge Smashing Pumpkins fan. And I know it's not the pumpkins of the nineties anymore, but sure. You know, you're gonna hear but some it's hits. It's still something. Yeah, it's you'll still, hear the hits. What three quarters yeah. of Smashing Pumpkins, right? So pretty much. Yeah, I think Eha is technically in the band at this point. So I thought you're, Chamberlain you're getting... was with him too. Is, oh, is... he might be. Yeah. So then you're you're I just missing Jimmy Darcy. Yeah. Um Jane's puts on a flashy show. Like I've I've only seen them I've definitely seen him once. I might have seen him twice. Mm-hmm. Um the one time I remember seeing them, though, they had women who had some sort of massive piercing uh, through their shoulder blades or something, oh. and they were hanging from the top of the stage by their what? skin uh, and swinging themselves. Uh, you, you Google it, you'll, you'll find the video. It is. No, I'm good. It is crazy, <laughs> dude. I remember watching it being like, I can't these I mean they were hanging eight feet, ten feet over the stage oh, and God. like kicking themselves back and forth to swing themselves out over the crowd. It was in no, it by their skin. Thanks. Yeah. So but you'll probably if you go to the show, you'll probably have a good time. Just like the spectacle of it all will be fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um and Jane's has some bangers. Um the energy will be good. It it would be I would put up with it to see Smashing Bunk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um I'll tell you, so I uh, I was at a show this past week, and uh, I took my wife. We went to go see Florence and the Machine. It was like a nice. warm-up show before her like arena run this yeah. summer. So it's um, a smaller venue? It was at Lincoln Center, like in a, oh, okay. in a smaller theater, but it was nice. still a I couple love hundred people. Shows. Yeah, um, but she was like, at the energy, I mean, my wife walked out of that, and she was just like, that... 
Oh my god! I, she was like, I I've never felt energy in a room like that, and we've been to a lot of shows, and it's been a while. Like that was the first concert that she's really been back to. Oh yeah. Um, so I think there's a little of that too, but I'm sure it was like the the dancing and the the there was like a community there. Like what we walked into, and and I'm a fan. My wife's a fan. Yeah. You know, so it's not like we felt out of place, but we walked into people who were dressed wearing kilts and gold wigs and like. Uh, so one guy was dressed up like a a soldier, like a fancy kind of soldier or whatever. And like, like going to a Ren all, fair. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it was like everybody was there like flying their own individual flag of what they wanted to be. That's pretty or cool, what they though. felt. Yeah, it was really amazing. And so my wife in there were like norm core clothes just <laughs> like core. the no like the total like Parent whatever core. i had yeah it's exactly what it was <laughs> but like we were also accepted around that too like it yeah. was everybody it was just a really cool communal feeling it's one of the, you know you look for that in a lot of concerts sometimes you're hoping to just like have this experience with whoever's performing and sometimes you want to feel the room Mm -hmm. and this was one where you just like really felt the room where everyone was like oh my god i can't believe this is happening you know like it was very cool that's neat um and the new album is out and it's gorgeous um i picked that up this week Um, i need to listen to that yeah there were a bunch of like i walked in to my record store and i was like i didn't know what to grab because there's like there was the standard and the deluxe CD. There was the vinyl. And then there's like a hardcover book oh, with goodness. the album that like is lyrics and all kind of, um, you know, it's like laid out in a special way. Yeah. It's not just like liner notes or whatever. Um, and again, my wife was like really resonating with this. So I, I snagged that because I knew she'd want to sit there. And it's a cool. Oh, neat. It's a cool physical thing. You know, it like looks like a book. Like it's not going to fit on any of my shelves. So I don't know where I'm going to put right. it. But <laughs> I'm going to put it with my books, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I, I grabbed that. I thought that it, that was an interesting thing to sell a CD. You know, like if you sell a CD within some sort of curated book thing, um, it's almost the same to me as buying vinyl to have the physical vinyl. I, yeah. I think, you know, I listen to my vinyl, but I know a lot of people buy it just to physically have something that they connect with mm-hmm. uh, and to have that artwork. So it's not that different from that. Like if that's how you're buying music or why you're buying music, it's not that far off. Yeah. And it's it's also just it's an extension of the artist's vision yeah. for, for that album. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's, it's always nice to have that because whenever it goes just a little bit beyond the normal, like, Hey, these are the 12 songs and this is the cover artwork there. there, You always kind of get a little bit more out of the album because you're, you're getting another dimension of the artist's vision if you want to put it that way. So Yeah. yeah, I'm always cool with that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I thought that that was pretty neat. Um, yeah, you're you're right. Like, if the artist has taken the time to curate this and build this out, um, and I love that. If I can appreciate and bond with that artist, then yeah, I'm totally mm-hmm. there for it. Um, I also I picked up. Uh, so Orville Peck released his second album last month, and I've only spent spent a little time with it. Um, I've really liked it so far, and it's just I've had a couple people talk to me about how like this artist is really kind of coming into his own it's it's something that i want to spend some time with um Mm -hmm. and it wasn't super expensive or anything uh and like i said i i'd heard a couple songs and i could feel like it was clicking with me so i just kind of pulled the trigger while i was there i saw it on the shelf and i was like yeah i'll I'll rock with this i'll I'll roll the dice you know like there it's possible that i picked up an album that i'm only going to listen to once or twice but i don't i don't think so yeah um i went on so while i was traveling um i brought my trusty ipod touch to uh to scotland now continue discontinued that that, that is now discontinued um i brought my ipod touch because i never know if the car that we rent is gonna have like bluetooth or a patch or whatever and like if my streaming service or my data is gonna work wherever it is right what fm situation is gonna be like so i like to just kind of have some music in my back pocket just in case 
Um, and we did kind of run into that, you know, like data was a little spotty where we were um, in certain places. So there's this artist that I think I've talked about before. His name is William Tyler. He's He writes these like beautiful um, guitar driven albums, all instrumental, no vocals. Um, I discovered him on an album back in 2019 and I had pulled another one. And so I had two of his albums on my iPod and it just worked so Mm -hmm. nicely as we were driving amongst like the mountains of Scotland and whatnot. That sounds awesome. It (laughs) felt so good. It felt so so good that like I, when we did get back to a service area, um, I popped up because he was signed to Merge for a couple albums, and I think he recently left after the last album. Um, but I went on Merge's website just to see like what they had for sale, if there's anything, and they were doing like buy two of his albums and take a couple bucks off or something, and they weren't that expensive. So I just total impulse bought the other yeah. two albums that nice. I don't have. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And they, they came in the other day and I popped it on and it's just, yeah, it's just really good music to have on in the background. It's just the easiest, it, like it moves you a little bit, but not so much that you, you want to sit there and listen to it the whole time. Maybe. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, it's, it's really great. Any, anything by William Tyler is, is just awesome. Very cool. Um, and then the last thing I picked up, um again digging through the new arrivals section it's such a weird mishmash and i found this copy of decadence which is an album by a band called head automatica which Mm -hmm. was daryl palumbo of glass jaws like side project in the 2000s right uh like mid 2000s i think it probably was 2004 um very like dance alt dance rock i don't even know like yeah what to call no there it. It was a lot of that back then yeah it was like that like synthy kind of throwbacky dancing but mixed with the emo core stuff mm-hmm. like moving um, units like that yeah. kind of thing and even like panic at the disco kind of spawned out of some of that too like there was that like danciness to that scene um but this was this was like i loved 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 this album um i mean i had to i went through i scratched up my first cd i have a second one now um (laughs) but it's one of these like albums that resonated with me that since doing this podcast even specifically but just like in kind of getting into having physical media like i've gone back to a few albums that i remember spending a lot of time with and thinking like "Ah, it'd be nice to like have a really good version of that physically Mm -hmm. right like i have a cd and that's great but maybe there's something else um and i came across this and like i said it was in the new arrivals bin so it wasn't super expensive and nice had to had to snag that um and then so I've been listening to so I have had a bunch of artists that I love that have always cited John Prine. I knew a few of his songs, but like I really feel like he's an artist that I need to spend time with. So I'm currently like yeah. starting at the beginning and digging in on John Prine right now. Um great songwriter and oh, yeah. I, I just I'm I'm enjoying it. I don't feel like it's uh, I don't feel like it's a process or anything. Um, it feels good. And so I'm kind of excited to just immerse myself in his discography right now. Yeah. There's a lot there um, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he's, he wrote a ton and he worked with a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just dipped my toe. I listened through once and kind of revisited one or two songs uh, on the Kendrick album. I saw that. Um, which just dropped. And uh, I think Is it's pretty like good. Is that like a surprise drop thing? Kind of, yeah. Like there were rumblings about it a couple of days before, but it wasn't it wasn't really like pre announced or anything like that. Yeah, that's what um, it felt like. And so like you're not you're also not getting um like vinyl or anything like that, you know, like the like I'm sure at some point there Eventually, will be, but yeah. yeah, it's gonna be down the road. Um I haven't even seen if there's like a pre order or anything. Um that's just kinda it's how good. it is right it's, now. Yeah, it's just you know, his stuff is going to be challenging in a way, right? Like he's he he took 5 years, he's been working on this. He's he steps away from the spotlight. He curates what he what he does, you yeah. know, he's very calculated. He's got a message. Absolutely. Um and he tends to be, you know, 
pretty expansive and he can get combative in his songs. There's a lot of things going on in this album that like make you feel very uncomfortable. There was one song where it was like a fight between him and his significant other and it feels like a real fight. Like it's oh, like I've heard this before kind of thing. Um, and there's another one that's just talking about how like uh, it's about like how to be like being a dad and dealing with your daddy issues as a man and yeah, this oh, man. He goes he goes real in yeah. and I feel like some of the hip hop community's not really feeling it, which to me does make it seem like maybe then this is that much more of an important album because it's like pushing boundaries of everything. Um Yeah, he so, he, he w- whether it's intentional or not, he pushes buttons. Yeah. And, you know, um <clears throat> I'm I'm definitely a fan. I I'm not like you know, buying his albums and going, you know, pouring through every lyric and things like that. But, uh, I'm always impressed by, by what he does and I'm just not like super plugged into it. So I, I, it was on my like mental to do list to dig into this, but you're making me excited to get, to get into it. Yeah. So, it's really good. Yeah. Nice. You'll, you'll dig it. Um, and I think that that's it. Uh, th- I mean, just I would just reiterate: if you haven't spent any time with the Florence album, it's it's really great. Um, For sure. There's there's uh there's this lyric that hit me in one of the songs that like is still kind of echoing in my brain, and I I just think it speaks to some of the stuff we talk about on here, and some of the stuff that I hear about just outside of everywhere it, when it comes to music where she says um, that you say rock and roll is dead, but is that because it hasn't been resurrected in your image? And it's like, wow. that's, that's ev- like that. It's so spot on that. W- and nothing against some of the bands that we can talk about that do get kind of brought up because they sound very similar to a band from 30 or 40 years ago. But like mm-hmm. when we talk about what, quote unquote rock is or how alternative has grown or what it, what it becomes or how it's interpreted. Like it's just a really smart, concise way of saying like your perspective might be off a little bit. Right. Right. You should listen, <laughs> listen up, like listen and pay attention because rock actually is or could be thriving. You're just missing it because you've defined it as something. Yeah. Else. You're looking for something from exactly. 20 years ago. <laughs> right. Right. Wow. Right. That's really, yeah, cool. it's a really good lyric. It's just like, <clears throat> it's one of those things that when you're listening to a song and something kind of goes cruising by and it like flicks you between the eyes and you're like, right. Whoa, okay. <laughs> wow. You just made a killer point right there. Yeah. Yep. Um, awesome. what about you? Have you been able to get out shopping at all? I, I did. I made it to my <clears throat> my local a couple days ago. Excuse me. Nice. <clears throat> still, you know, I'm still Froggy. in the, in the throes of recovery. Yeah. Um, but I I had to get out to my local. Um, I, it had been too long, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna head out. I'm gonna go like first thing in the morning on like a Thursday when you mm-hmm. know no one's gonna be there. <clears throat> and uh, like you've been doing, just kind of hitting the new arrivals bin. Because once you've been to your regular for a while, you kind of already know what they have for the most part. Mm -hmm. So it's like you hit the new arrivals bin, you know what else is there besides that. So you're either, you know, looking for something specific or you, you know, you're you're done. Um, So I found um, one of Jim Croce's albums that I've been after for a while. You don't mess around with Jim. Um, It's it's his album with Time in a Bottle on it. And... um, a lot of his songs just really, really hit me hard. He's one of my my mom's favorite artists, so I'm always like, you know, extra um, emotionally connected to it. So mm-hmm. I got that. Um, it's only a few bucks, and then I found the Blues Brothers album, brief briefcase full of blues, and I just had to buy it. It's like. It, <laughs> It might be one of the, like you said, one of those albums that I only listen to once or twice. Um, yeah. But it's just so fun. And it it's such an iconic album cover. Yeah. So I had to, I, it was like $4. I was like, yes, I'm buying this. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so That's... Th- didn't find anything else that day that, that I really needed. But those two, I was like, all right, we're doing this. Well, um, I, I impulse bought 
the Blues Brother Nintendo 64 game not that long there ago. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'll probably only play once, but we'll see. Play it once yeah. and put it back on the shelf and then Same there it deal. is. Same deal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then I've been listening to quite a bit. Um, so uh, one, I, I don't listen to a lot of the really heavy music. Mm-hmm. I'm not like a, I'm not really big into metal so much, but I don't constrain myself to certain genres. I'll listen sure. to what I like and I don't listen to what I don't like it, it, regardless of the genre. Um, but cave in has um, been a favorite of mine since way back more than 20 years ago um, since 99, 2000 um, back when they were more so a local band in the, the Boston area Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, I, I found out about them from friends cause you know, one of the guys knew somebody in the band or something like that. You know what I mean? They were more local back then. And, um, they kind of surprisingly said, we all thought their last album, which was called like final transmission or something like that. Uh, we thought, okay, that's the last album they're done. Yeah. And like they had like a band member pass away. It was like really yeah. tragic. So yeah. we thought it was like, okay, that's it. There's no more cave in. Mm-hmm. They have a new album coming out and it's, it's, it's coming out on the 20th. So the day that this is going to air so um, crazy. called heavy pendulum. And it's, th- there's like three or four songs that you can listen to that are available it's mm-hmm. so good and I'm loving it. Um, so I'm happy that they're back and you know, they, they're just as hard hitting and melodic as ever. Um, really, really great music. Even if you're not normally into like the super heavy, um, type of music, it, it's worth giving it a shot. Um, so that's, that's been on rotation. Um, and then another kind of classic for me, um, I've been rotating back and forth through, um, blonde redhead, their, their discography, but more so their 2000 album melody of certain damaged lemons, um, <clears throat> which is where I was first kind of introduced to them probably in either late 2000 or early 2001. Okay. Um, it's usually like a really good gloomy, like either winter or just like bad weather type of album. Yeah. Um, and, and I love them. They're definitely either, I don't know what you want to call it an acquired taste or either you love it or you hate it. Yeah. Um, but I, I just love them and their style. Um, so I, I'll go back to that album, you know, at least once a year again, usually in the winter, but, um, you know, we had some, we had a few days of thunderstorms here in Texas, uh, earlier in the week and it was like perfect for, for some blonde redheads. So I, I had that going. Did you just like decide that? Like there, was there like a, a catalyst or a new music or anything? Or you were just like something reminded thunderstorms me. and yeah. <laughs> I think one of my friends posted like something either on like Facebook or, something. or okay. I think it was a YouTube video. And I was like, Oh yeah, man, that's one of my favorite albums. And so like yeah. I put it on um, and it just happened to coincide with some bad weather. So it was pretty perfect. Um, but I'll go back to that at least once or twice a year. It's just an amazing album. Um, and they kind of had a resurgence somewhat recently because they had one of their songs from this album do that thing that TikTok does where (laughs) somebody uses a a snippet from the song and then that goes viral and people start using that audio. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it, it, that may actually go back to the Vine days, um, but uh, it's just like this really sad interlude. So yeah. it became viral and like coinciding with like really unfortunate things happening. <laughs> so uh, that that always kind of comes back. Um, I've also been to change, you know, now yeah. for something completely different. Um, I've been back into the, uh, bit brigade rendition of Mega Man two. Um, not too long ago. I can't remember if it was last episode or the episode before, but, um, somebody asked us what our favorite game soundtracks were. And I'm always like right off the bat, like number one favorite is Mega Man two. That's my favorite. So 
Um, sometimes I just need something to kind of pump me up a little bit. And man, you put on like a rock version of Metal Man, uh, Mega Man Two, particularly yeah. like the the Metal Man levels or the um, Air Man levels. And it's like, you're just pumped. Like you got to watch, you got to put on cruise control or you're going to get like a ticket. It's like, (laughs) it's, it's just hype up music. So, um, I just needed to pick me up and, uh, the Mega Man two soundtrack will definitely do that. And bit brigade in particular has been really, um, just really, really killing it with the, the, the distorted guitar, heavy versions of the game soundtracks, uh, 20 years ago or so it was like mini bosses and there was a band out of California called the advantage that mm. would do, uh, oh, the advantage you know, is great rock and yeah. roll. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think bit brigade is, is one of the only kind of bigger ones that are actually still going. Um, and you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, but they're the only ones that I keep seeing come up as like an active force in the, rock and roll rendition of game uh, eight bit game soundtracks. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's really the, the long and short of it for me. Cool. Um, want to hit a little new stuff here before we, uh, dive into some history in a game. Yeah. There's some news to talk yeah. about here. Sweet. So, uh, a couple things. One, uh, my chemical romance. Let's talk about them for a second. So, Band uh, put out four albums over the span of their career. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say it's over. It was over the course of maybe like eight or nine years. Um, that like two thousands to twenty twelve. I think they broke up. Um, and great band. Nothing against them. Uh, they created this scene. Right. Mm-hmm. They like basically like hit the right music, the right style, did the right thing at the right time to define or cement like the next wave of emo rock, whatever. But then mm-hmm. they like bounced, right? Yeah, then they like disappeared, right? Split and left it hanging so that you're like, are they the greatest of that? genre or that era or is it a fluke right like the more that you show up the more opportunities you have to either better yourself and and better your standing in the annals mm-hmm. of history or to prove that like uh you're never going to stack up yeah to it was a flash in the pan right there's some people that wish that coldplay stopped putting out albums, <laughs> a few albums ago right like like that's just like it's just the way it is. Like the more that you churn out, the more that you are weaving kind of your story. And in this sense, the fans, yeah. yeah, In this sense, like the fans have kind of carried it, you know, like the, the legacy is, is built. Um, The band went and did their own things. They've had side projects. Gerard ways had a TV show and a comic book series and all this other stuff. Oh man. Um, And so, all you needed was like they're going out on on a reunion tour. It was supposed to happen about a year and a half ago, um, and they just they just dropped a song like out of out of nowhere, like a new song, the first new song in ten years, I think. Wow, uh, from this band, um, and it's good. It like it sounds like what you would hope this band would sound like after they've gotten a little older and are mm-hmm. experimenting a little bit, but still retain that kind of screamy sceney stuff yeah. um it's a great song uh it definitely stirred the internet up and and i mean we've got new black keys new florence new arcade fire new kendrick like they are uh, new harry styles music like they are operating in uh, a very competitive ecosystem for right. new music across the board right now mm-hmm. and it's i mean it's what the kids are talking about which is crazy for a band whose last album came out when they were probably in like kindergarten if that <laughs> you know like it's so insane that this band put out an album over 10 years ago that resonated with kids who weren't alive potentially when this yeah. album came out um like that doesn't happen that often no, it really um, doesn't and you got to yeah. hand it to them it's i mean yeah. it's definitely not my thing but sure. it's you, you have to respect 
what they did or what they were yeah. able to do and what they created. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I saw like the, the buzz about it in, in just like the small circle of like, you know, social media and, and gaming, uh, mutuals that, that I, you know, see on my feed. Well, and, and on the emo Reddit that you go on, right? You're on, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're on your emo Reddit pages or whatever. <laughs> no. No, not, not so much, but, <laughs> okay, um, <cool. laughs> that, that, you know, I, the fact that it reached you, the f- like, exactly yeah. my point, yeah. you know, the fact yeah. that I saw something about it, is yeah. like, oh wow, okay, that this is this is kind of a big deal. Yeah, um, and they almost don't need to put out an album. They just need to be an album. I, like no, they have a song they and they to. put it out. They've already sold out the tour. They sold it out two years ago. You know, maybe they'll add more dates. Maybe this is a sign of something else to come. But like, you could just as this band do that every four to five years, and. The what one song and a tour, and you fill the coffers, and you can go off and do whatever you want, like, yep, and not piss it. off your fans too. You know, like that's that's kind of the dream. You know, like obviously, yeah. You know, as a fan of anything, uh, I want more. Um, right. We're, we all get selfish, but like, this is more than those fans have been expecting for a long time. And there's also, you know, I could definitely see if it's if it's been roughly 10 years since mm-hmm. they put out an album maybe just testing the waters first because yeah. if you put out a single and there's little to no interest then there's no point in putting forth the effort to do a whole album sure, but if you point. put out a single and people are going bonkers over it okay so there there's enough interest still that it's worth the time, effort, and expense of doing a full blown album. Yeah. So I could see that for sure. Yeah. It's a good <clears throat> but point. Good on them. Yeah. Um, so the Who are out Ooh. on the road or hitting the road. Who? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, they are hitting the road uh, this summer. And um, they are they just recently made a stop in Cincinnati, which mm. wouldn't mean much of anything, right? Except if you're in the know about your music history. Mm-hmm. Um, they have not been back to play Cincinnati since 1979, which reason. was the site of the Riverfront Coliseum disaster, where 11 people died. Um, historically, there's always been a lot of confusion over how things actually played out but basically i mean it was eighteen thousand tickets yeah. sold um you had a massive uh group of people that were waiting outside of the venue um and as it goes apparently two hours before the show was scheduled to start um somebody was testing the audio equipment or whatever but they tested it with the Who's music. Um, and it's interesting because now when I hear s- tests at certain things, like big things, they'll just play the Star Wars theme or something. Yeah, just because it's whatever. a good way to test it, right? Um, but they don't play the actual performing artist's music. Typically not, um, yeah. And I'm, I wonder if maybe that is a holdover of this because what happened is the people out there are like, Oh my God, the Who are on the stage, right? And so you, there were only two doors that were open and unlocked at the time into the entire r- arena, and so you had this mad crash, crush for Ugh. those two doors. Um, and it, you read back to the accounts of that time about people like being lifted off their feet, people not being able yep. to breathe, um, and it harkens back to some of the testimony you hear from the Travis Scott thing. Right. Um, so it's definitely it's existed before. So, uh, but the who were not aware that this happened. So management found out uh, it, in during the day like that this this crush happened and there was a disaster outside. Um, but the band wasn't told, and management decided that the show should continue to go on. So the Who take the stage, oh, and man. they perform the concert, and then they find out afterwards man, that that's gotta this be happened. Man, that's got a terrible feeling. Yeah, and then they Jeez. have to make the decision in that moment, like what to do, and they leave. They leave town. 
they move on with the tour. They go to the next gig. Um, and, uh, and it ha- never came back. Like there was all this questioning after the fact of like, they should have stuck around and, and mourned with the fans and taken a minute and, and paused. And I think now we see that kind of thing. Um, you know, information gets around a lot quicker, Yeah. but, um, there's also some precedent set and there's a lot more, uh, mindfulness that goes on, I think. And yeah, so, definitely. so they never went back and performed in that city again um, for a multitude of reasons, but I'm assuming because it was always just a really sore situation, how it yeah. played out. And so the band's taken it to um, to remedy that, and they've made a bunch of donations to some of the organizations that came about to honor the people who lost their lives. Um, yeah. uh, so it's, it, it's interesting. Uh, I'm... I haven't seen any of the reviews of how the show goes over, and I'm sure there'll be some local articles. I'd like to check that out. Um, I think it's it's special that it's happening. Um, I I think that if it's done the right way, it's great, uh, and it seems like they understand that there's still, even decades later, some sort of apologies or or just kind of discussion discourse to have about it yeah Um, there's some significance there for sure yeah Mm -hmm. they're they're addressing it for sure um so that's good um and zach starkey is playing on uh on drums which is ringo's kid so that's super fun so go see the who they're fun (laughs) um uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, some people are pretty bummed about it. Some people are jazzed. Uh, Dolly Parton did get in, and she said she'll show up. She was like, don't vote for me, but they already had, so she's yeah. getting in. Um, Pat Benatar, Duran Duran, Eminem, The Eurythmics. Judas Priest finally getting in. Oh, okay. Um, Harry Belafonte, Lionel Richie, Carly Simon. It's a it's a real weird like spread this year. Seems pretty um, stacked though. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's some heavy heavy hitters, um, and it it does cover a lot of bases. Um, so it should make for a good ceremony. Uh, obviously, there's always going to be people that are bummed that of certain course. folks got in and certain didn't, but um, but pretty good representative year. And uh, and then you pointed out this this last piece uh, with with Pearl Jam. Yeah, this was just wow. like a little thing that I saw uh, honestly at the last minute here as I was killing time before we were gonna hop on mm-hmm. to record. Um, but so I guess Pearl Jam's uh, Oakland show um, <clears throat> uh, earlier in the day, uh, Matt Cameron, their drummer, um, ended up testing positive for COVID. So he couldn't, you know, do the show and be around the rest of the band and the crew and put the whole, you know, uh, tour and the whole organization at risk. So, um, he had to bow out and, you know, that's always, okay. A key member of the band, like, what are you going to do? So, um, and it's not, it's still not a hundred percent clear, at least from what I was able to read, how it ended up happening. Um, mm-hmm. but they got this kid, uh, this, this guy, Kai Newkerman's, um, 18 year old drummer, uh, with a, a local band, um, called the alive, I believe is what his band was called. And it's like, you know, his, his like 15 year old younger brother is in the band. It's like a, you know, small local thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess at some point, um, he had met, um, Eddie Vedder's daughter at like an event, uh, okay. a local event or something like yeah. that. So there was a little bit of like, you know, they sort of kind of knew about each other at the very least. Uh-huh. Um, he ends up filling in for Matt Cameron for their show at the Oakland arena. Amazing. And it's, it, there's YouTube uh, video of it. And it's like, imagine being 18 years old and like, y- one of the biggest rock bands in history at this point. Mm -hmm. And you fill in for one of their key members. Yeah. I cannot like, Oh my God. 
I mean, I'd never be able to, even if I had the talent, I would just throw up the entire time. I'd just keep continuously puking on myself. Well, if the, um, if the quick YouTube clip that I saw is any indication, he just, he nailed it. So, yeah. um, you know, pro- number one, major props to uh, Kai for having the cojones to even do that get up in in front of you know however many uh you know something like twenty thousand people at the oakland arena but props to pearl jam for you know giving the guy a chance you know yeah (laughs) so they they must have been aware of his skill other i mean they wouldn't put that you know they wouldn't put that to risk someone they've never heard play before i would assume (laughs) Yeah, it's an but, interesting thing that, like, you know, there's plenty of artists who have a vision for what they want to do or are very particular about the way that they sound, and so they wouldn't be open to something like this. Um, it is very cool that Pearl Jam has this expansive artist community of, of drummers that filled in, but then also can look to fans and uh, and other bands that are influenced by them and kind of call on them and say, like, because they already postponed a lot of these shows. These are make goods for COVID yeah. uh, postponements. And so they're like, yeah, we don't want to do this again. Um, yeah. So yeah. let's let's figure this out. Like, what can we what can we do here? And I saw that uh, they like had a music teacher that also came up and performed with them at some point, like some music teacher that had oh, reached man. out and they're like, yeah, let's get this guy. Um, that's really cool. You know, like I understand that that's not for every artist, um, but it's amazing to foster a community like that and have that kind of come together. I, the energy in the room, knowing that this like young teenage kid is just up there living his best life must have just amplified things like if you go there and you don't get to see matt cameron play drums that is a bummer but it you get this crazy other exchange instead that's really really cool yeah yeah so it's just a cool moment i thought it was worth mentioning for sure um you don't you don't see stuff i mean you always have those bands that hey we brought an audience member up for one song and you're kind of like okay was it staged was it not staged whatever yeah but yeah. you know this seemed very different you know they they literally brought this guy up <clears throat> 18 years old played the whole show so that's i thought that was significant yeah um but we do have some birthdays to uh honor here um coming into the the tail end of may um so may 20th 1944 joe cocker uh british um singer songwriter uh very soulful obviously probably most known for his cover of um the Beatles, a little help, uh, little my help for my friends, which was then the Wonder Years. Yeah, the Wonder Years. So everyone, you know, I knew it from the Wonder Years, being the age that I am. Yeah, um, same. But uh, you know, I've got one or two of his albums hanging around. Amazing vocalists. Um, yeah, put out some wonderful music. Uh, May twentieth, nineteen sixty one. Um, Dan Wilson, who was. Uh, maybe, you know, most popular for his band Semisonic wrote Closing Time. Never, you know, who doesn't know Closing Time? Um, but something that I didn't know, co-wrote Not Ready to Make Nice oh, yeah. with the Dixie Chicks and mm-hmm. co-wrote Someone Like You with Adele. Adele. Yep. So no, he's written a ton <clears throat> of stuff. He's he's like a prolific songwriter. He's, he's that's fantastic. like Adam. Yeah. Sh- <clears throat> excuse me. That's like Adam Schlesinger yep. level stuff. Yeah. It's like he had this kind of sort of one hit wonder band Mm -hmm. and like went on to co-write so much amazing stuff. And it's like, Whoa, so good on him. Happy birthday to Dan Wilson. I can't believe he's 60. That's crazy. When I was just looking at this number, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't sound right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. But it's, it's, I guess it's true. I mean, it's closing time was over 20 years ago. It would have put him in his late thirties during that, I guess. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so he it, he got um they were nominated for closing time uh for a Grammy for best rock song but but he's actually won for song of the year um with the Dixie Chicks and then album of the year um alongside Adele's album. So Oh wow. 
Okay. So he's got Grammys, just not yeah, for Semisonic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he does a lot of co-writes. Like if you dig through your liner notes of your favorite albums in like that pop rock space, you'll you'll see his name yeah. bubble up a bunch of times. He's written with Spoon and Weezer and My Morning Jacket and Florence and the Machine. I mean, he's written with, That's awesome. with everybody. Yeah, awesome. Uh, and then May 20th, 1972, happy birthday to hip hop artist Busta Rhymes, who yeah. uh, I can't remember the name now, but we just had him on the name game recently. Yeah, um, I don't remember his real name either. Uh, yeah, th- those are always <laughs> Which tough means we to can remember. bring it back. Yeah, <laughs> we can bring it back at some point, and no one will ever know. Yeah, um, I love Busta Rhymes. Oh, man. huge like, fan. That was, yeah, like that. I remember seeing. Uh, the dangerous fisheye lens yep. music video for dangerous. And I was like, this is the coolest thing. Oh my God. And I went out and I bought when disaster strikes and yep. listened to that front to back over and over again, man. I love He's it. Fantastic. Yeah. I was so into that, like kind of, I don't know what, you, if you'd call it alternative hip hop or whatever, but I was so into yeah. like Busta rhyme, Cypress Hill. Like I loved it. I was so into yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and then his most recent album is like off the wall. It's so good. Really? So, yeah. He's got, and he's got so many people on there he, and he, right, he was working on it for forever. It's, it's, you should check it out. I, I need to dig back into it. Cause I, I got into it. I listened to it like two or three times and then like something else launched and I, I went away from it and I need to get back into it, but man, it's really good. Oh, it says it's like a sequel to his third album, Extinction Level Event. Right. That's awesome. Extinction Level so Event. There's so many the people. God. There's so many oh, yeah, look at this. on that album. Kendrick, Q Tip, Rick Ross, yes. Mary J. It's nuts. Oh, man, this is awesome. All right. I'm going to. I got this. It's looks super great. good. Super good. And then here is an oldie, but a goodie. Mm-hmm. May 21st, 1904. Oh, man. Fats Waller. And I've got I've got his I've got ain't mis, ain't misbehaving somewhere around here, but he's an American jazz piano player, organ player, composer, singer, and comedic entertainer, uh, best known for ain't misbehaving. Um, and then the fun fact I always like to try to throw something in there if we've got something. Mm-hmm. Nin- in 1926, uh, Fats Waller was kidnapped at gunpoint in Chicago and driven to a club owned by Al Capone. And was ordered Jesus. to perform at what turned out to be a surprise birthday party for Al Capone, <laughs> the gangster. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's one way to get somebody for your birthday party. At Stick gun a gun point. in his face. Oh I mean, they could have just offered him money and he probably would have done it. But no, it's they had, you know, it was the it was the 20s in Chicago. They had to do it at gunpoint. <laughs> Man, stuff is always just so sketchy. It's That's crazy. Amazing. I was crazy to hear about stuff from a hundred years ago. Yeah. That's nuts. Um, May 21st, 1941, Ronald Isley of the Isley brothers, classic group. Yeah. Uh, May 21st, 1972, notorious B I G AKA Christopher Wallace. Um, we also mentioned on the name game, not too long ago. Um, obviously best known for his number one hit single hypnotize, which dropped in 97. And we also lost him in 97, um, killed in Los Angeles on March 9th, 1997 at the age of 24. It's so hard to believe he was that young. Crazy. It's so bonkers. Crazy. Yeah. If you, you feel like his career was so much longer than that, but yeah, uh, he was so young. Um, and then a couple more here, May 21st, 1980, uh, Belgian born Australian artist, multi instrumentalist, and singer songwriter Gautier. Um, everyone knows um, somebody that I used to know. Got to be crazy to have a song that that was that massive of a hit. And then, like, at least internationally, that's like all you're really known for, for the most part. Where are you, Gautier? <laughs> that's the go? thing. Where are you? I'm sure he's what better happened? known, like, in his home country of Australia, but, like... I, he that's... hasn't put out an album since. That album, would... that song was huge yeah. and drove album sales for that album, and it's like, he really hasn't put anything out since? 
I don't. I mean, I don't think he's put out an album. No, I like. I crazy. was talking to somebody about Gautier not that long ago, and we were digging around, and like, it's not that he's fallen off the face of the earth entirely, but like, I think there was like some live recordings or something put out, but like nothing of mm. a original music. I think he's just taken the money and he's kind of, you know, experimenting on the side of things. But yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that he got. Yeah, he he. I think he did like some kind of side project or something we unearthed that there's like some other band that he became tied in with and did some mm. other stuff with them instead. All right, man. Do, do yeah. you go TA, yeah. go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, you earned it. Um, and then last but not least, May 22nd, 1959, happy birthday to English singer songwriter, Morrissey, love him or hate him. He's here to stay. And, that wraps up our birthdays for this episode. I um, think we got time for a quick uh, what's in a name before we Let's flip it do over. It. At some point, I need to like write and record a silly little theme song for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the game. <laughs> we'll see if that ever ends up materializing. Um, <clears throat> but if this is your first time... Um, experiencing what's in a name. Um, each of us have picked four artists and we will present to the other, um, the birth name of that artist, um, or legal name. Um, and the idea is to guess the stage name or, you know, who the artist is known as, um, maximum of a hundred points, um, for four perfect guesses worth 25 points each. And then points are docked, for missed guesses or major hints given. Uh, do you want to go first or do you want to pass? Uh, I'll go first. Okay. Wait, go first as in like give my names first or go first as Either way. in guess first. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll let me guess first. Let's start with me guessing okay. first. All right, yeah. Liam's going to guess first. All right. So I'm going to pull up my names here. And as, as always, I like to have at least somewhat of a theme <clears throat> same and so same. uh this would be um pop artists of the late 50s to mid 60s so we're going oh way back here <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> so i i tried to tone down the difficulty um okay. I, I think you probably will get both of these okay or all all four of these and um, the first one here should be easy mode and it is also her birthday, at least as of the date of, uh, the day this episode drops on May 20th. Okay. Okay. So the first name, happy birthday to Sherilyn Sarkazian. Wait, we just did birthdays you're saying? It wasn't anybody that we've mentioned. I oh, okay, okay. I purposefully okay. left her off of the birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> so we're celebrating her birthday in the game. But the name is Sherilyn I mean, Sarkazian. Is it just sh- Cher? Yep, it is. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least she kept that simple. Okay. Yeah. Sarkazian. Sarkazian. I'm guessing Greek. Yeah, it sounds like I'm not sure. Greek or maybe. Um, so good guess, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, C-H-E-R-I-L-Y-N. it's in the name though. Yeah. yeah. And most yeah. of these are kind of like that. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. So the next name is Charles Harden Holly. Is it Buddy Holly? It's Buddy Holly. Okay. So nice. Charles That's Harden cool. Holly, the last name is H O L L E Y. Oh, um, okay. so last name is spelled a little bit differently, but you know, sounds. I the was same. afraid if it wasn't Buddy Holly, I was going to have to dig into the the Hollies, which Graham Nash oh. was in. Oh, but I think that's his real name. So I was like, who else is in the Ooh. Hollies? Because now I'm in trouble. But didn't have to go there. <laughs> so cool. All right, next we have Richard Wayne Penniman. 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 P E N N I M A N. Penniman. Uh, 
I think I'm going to need a hint on this one. Um, so this was one of the most popular rock and roll artists of the 50s. Peniman. One of the, I would say, one of the pioneers of rock and roll. Huh. And I think only and only died like a couple years ago. Oh, but he's passed. Yeah. Oh, uh, Little Richard. Yes. Little Richard. Little Richard. Yeah, he passed. Yeah, he did pass pretty recently. I think in 2020. Sorry, I was hung up on Peniman. I was like, <laughs> is there a thing in there? There was some like, deflection there, maybe. It's just <laughs> Richard. <laughs> it's just the straight up Richard. Passed yeah. over the Richard part. <laughs> I did. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's Little Richard. Um, I guess we'll call that 20 points. I give a Yeah, hint, yeah, so. you give me a hint. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, but this is the last one. Mm-hmm. Stevland Hardaway Morris. Stevland. Stevland. So it's S T E V L A N D. Hardaway Morris. S- probably Stevland. I don't know how else you would pronounce that. Stefan Morris. Morris. Not ringing a bell. Now I'm going to need a hint on this one. Um, so very popular, very, very popular artist. Um, more so, I think, in the 60s um, okay. and then into the 70s as well. Um like a pop singer was you said? Uh, basically yeah um uh, along with little richard was also would accompany himself on uh keyboards key player it was stevland morris s t e v l a n d whatever that's pronounced Keyboard well, player. I'm going to take a shot. Is it? Yeah. Is it Stevie Wonder? I mean, it's I'm thinking Stevland, Steve. I mean, you're not going, you're not Stevland Wonder. Is it Stevie Wonder? <laughs> it's Stevie Wonder. Yes, it is. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> Stevland. Um, what Steveland? Kind of Steveland? Steveland? I don't know. I got to um, look this up. That's what it is. It it surprised me too, but um, said S T E V L A N D. So that's his uh, birth name, legal name, Um, and yeah. So it's ninety points. Wow, good work. Yeah, Steveland Hardaway. I it can't be Steveland. Steveland. It's (laughs) got to be Steveland. Yeah, I I mean I love Stevie Wonder and I had yeah. no idea. I mean, I guess it makes sense that Wonder's not his last name, but uh wow. All right. Cool. Yeah. That was um, a fun list. All right. So mine is unfortunately a little harder. Um it's okay. And right your theme I think will be apparent after the first name, but we'll okay. see. Um cuz the name this this akin to what you kind of just did with me. This one at least has the name in the name. Okay. Um, first name is Joe Hill. Joe. Joe Hill. Hill. Um. Joe Hill. Artist's name Joe. Maybe not uh, artists named Joe. Maybe not artists named Joe. Too many Joes. It's too many Joes. <laughs> too many, many Joes. Joes. Um, Hill. Um, I don't know. 
You definitely own a bunch of records by this artist. No, I don't. Are you serious? You definitely do. Like a million percent. Um. <clears throat> well, I'm going to need a hint either way. <laughs> either way. <laughs> well, okay. So you... Uh, Joe Hill. Y- you have a strong preference for the earlier part of the catalog, whereas my... My anecdotal experience comes mainly from the middle part of their catalog where the band kind of transformed a bit. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, I recently picked up an album by this band. Oh, you just bought a ZZ Top album. (laughs) And I love the first half of ZZ Top's discography. (laughs) So there's a really good chance that we're talking about Dusty Hill. We are talking about Dusty uh, okay. Joe, Joe Dusty Hill. Joe Dusty Hill. I didn't know that his first name was was first name you know Joe. for ZZ Top fans his first name is Dusty. Dusty okay, that's right. <laughs> that's his name. That's, that's right. Yeah, he was born Joe Michael Hill. Oh, okay. I yeah. learned something new today. All right. So Fantastic. and so we sadly we sadly lost him. Yes. Um. Very recently. And uh, and so Tragic. the rest of this list is also fairly in memoriam. Um, okay. So the next one is uh, Michael Aday, A D A Y. My oh, that sounds very familiar. Um, Michael oh. Aday. Predominant people that we lost uh, not not so long ago, pretty recently. Um, it's not really in his name, but I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any giveaways in this, uh, name, unfortunately. Um, oh, why? It's like super, it's like, I feel like I'm going to kick myself if I don't get it. Um, Michael a day, Michael a day. It's such an interesting last name. Lost uh, him uh, pretty recently. Like uh, I'm gonna need really a hint. Recently, I got nothing. Um, like I know, I know the name, and I'm probably gonna kick myself, but it's not coming to me. Was in um, at least one movie. No, he's in at least two movies uh, of of note. Um, okay. His co-writer, I believe, also died this past year before he died. Um, co-writer, the, the person who one might say actually was like the songwriting magic that then this artist oh. was the performer to. Um, so has uh, a yeah. co-writer, a strong co-writer. Yeah, his co-writer. I mean, very theatrical. Has was done in some movies. movies. Yeah, and past recently, and you, past you recently, got to be talking about Meatloaf. That's meatloaf. Really, yep. Michael I, a day. It's so yeah. weird because I know that name, but I'm definitely not associating it with meatloaf. Mm. Huh. Okay. All right. So that was a solid hint. What am I at? Forty. Twenty yeah. for each of those. Okay. Yeah. All right. Not All doing right, too bad. Two more. But I got to hit. More. I got to get two home runs in order to to tie with you here. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're gonna go from some rock to a little hip hop here. We're gonna go. Thanks to for the free hint. Yeah, Earl Simmons. <laughs> oh, come on. I know. I got to know this. I know that name. Uh, Lost a, co- a couple people in hip hop not, uh, not too long um, ago. Earl Simmons is. Oh, he just. Earl Simmons. Earl Simmons. And I, I, I learned his name because of his recent passing. It was mm. ve- pretty, like, very recent, right? Uh, it was almost a year ago now, actually. Like, it was, it, it still feels it because he was fairly young. I think he was like 50. But, um, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, a, I think it was just over a year ago. I'm looking right now, April 2021. So a year ago. Earl Simmons. Mm-hmm. 
hip hop artist that we just lost recently. Gotta yeah, be he's, iconic. He's Fifty, like pretty young, but like was in like his time of prominence was kind of within our uh, the hip hop time that we're talking about when we were fans uh, coming up. Shoot. I know I'm going to kick myself, but I feel like I need like one more hint. I'm not, I'm, uh, it's not coming to me. It's all good. Uh, let's see. How do I frame this? So, Earl Simmons. Yeah. So, 50. also known as the Dark Man. I'm trying to think of like what's a vague way without giving it away. He had his own crew. Eve was a part of that crew, came out of that. Um, Eve was think, a rough rider. Yeah, I think he oh, was in a bunch of... Oh, it's got to be DMX. It's DMX. Oh, my yeah. God. Dark Man X. Yep. Is that what... See, I didn't know the Dark Man thing threw me off. I didn't know what that oh, was. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Dark Man X. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. I Sounds like you. a comic know, book though. character. <laughs> there, well, there is Dark Man was... Dark Man was something. Sounds like a Mega Man character. There was even a no. There was even an <laughs> NES game. It was it was something. There was like a comic really? book character or something. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah. So the the being because I can see them on their motorcycles. They're they're yep. in the Rough Riders. Okay. Yep. Got it. Earl Simmons. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. I just couldn't um, think. Like I I could, I was picturing it in my head, but like the the name DMX wasn't coming to me. Okay. All right, last one. Um, Marcel Theo Hall, H A L L. Marcel. Marcel Theo, Theo Hall. Hall. This does kind of. There's like, a, I'm assuming that it's part. It's intentionally. It's got to be part of his name. So there is something in the name that is in his stage name. Um, yeah, Marcel, Marcel Theo, Theo Hall. Hall. Uh, a little older. Nothing's really old. popping out at me. He was born, uh, born in '64. Died this past July. He was 57. Oh, another hip-hop. recent. Yeah. Oh. So he's a little bit older of a hip hop star, but but. Was it Five Dog? No, I don't know. It couldn't have been because no, Five Dog was ago. a while ago. Yeah. Um. Yeah, this was last year. Born in born in New York uh, City, but actually grew up uh, like, like a half a mile from where I grew up. Oh, really? In, yeah, he grew up on Long Island, this guy. <sighs> I've got nothing on this one. Nothing. It's the Marcel. If the, like, there's a, the Marcel is the part of his name that, um, that is, uh, that is like in his stage name. And... He was also in a movie. Um, I th- he must have been in more than one, but he was in a movie. Uh, he had this cameo appearance that I wasn't even really aware of him, but I went to go see Men in Black 2. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Men in Black 2, um, but there's a great scene in uh, this post office where you're like meeting these aliens, and um, this guy is one of the aliens he plays one of the aliens as does michael jackson in that movie which is pretty crazy are you serious yeah uh this guy's the clown prince of hip-hop and he the had a clown massive hit prince of hip-hop. he had a massive hit in 89 uh just a friend oh just a friend mm-hmm. is Marcel. um nobody what, beats him what the heck Come on, dude. Just a friend. I know this. What is it? Why am I blanking on this? Don't don't say another no. word. <laughs> Just, <laughs> it's I know exactly who it is, but the name is not coming. He did on, a bunch of stuff. So Beastie Boys were super tight with him. I'm yeah. blaming it on COVID brain because I know exactly yeah. who it is, but the, it's this the name. Um come on, brain. Don't, don't, don't say anything. <laughs> I mean, it's a podcast. Just a friend. <laughs> you got what I need. 
Oh, come on. Marcel. Mm. Nobody beats him. Why is it not? It's not happening. Like there is a <laughs> brick wall right now. Yeah, it's that's brain. I know. Fog, I dude. can yeah. see him, and I can yeah. see his face. Yeah, and hear the entire song, and I'm going to slam my head against my CRT that's sitting right here next to me. Right nobody through the glass. Beats, nobody beats um, the... Uh, I'm so mad. I'm going to like edit this out. Like, <laughs> I lose. No. Not fair. Uh, come on, man. Why is this escaping me? Starts with a B. What's his name? Marcel. Bismarck. Bismarck. There he is. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good, dude. So good. Thank you. I told you. Also, I, I again. Like, I, I wouldn't I, have gotten it. Like it was. I never was pull gone. stuff. I'm. The I'm brick so wall bad at was there. I, yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. So mad. But I'm guessing Marquis is Marcel. I'm, I've never thought of it that way. But I also didn't know his name until this. Must have been. So, yeah. yeah. Ugh, I don't know why I couldn't. There was a bl- mental block there. Seriously. Like, I, I know mean, the, the Beastie song. Boys thing. Yeah. I was going to say the Beastie Boys thing. Like, he's he was so tight with those guys mm-hmm. coming up. Um, yeah. He was on that. Um, what was that band? <laughs> uh, Len. You remember that? They had that. Was he? That one hit wonder. Yeah. Um, if you steal my sunshine. sunshine. Remember that? Yeah. He yeah, was, yeah, yeah. He did a song with them on that album. <laughs> oh no way! I, yeah. That's so weird. Because it's weird. That song doesn't sound like any of the, any of the other songs on the album. It's like a classic hip hop throwback album, and he oh was, he's he's on one of the tracks on that album. That's so um, weird. It's it was definitely weird, but uh, man, I'm so mad at myself. I can't I can't blame myself though. Yeah, no, that's been happening yourself. all week. Yeah, <laughs> I could um, see his face. Staring at me with disappointment that I couldn't remember <laughs> like his name. Oh, and we yeah we just lost him that not that long ago. Yeah, it's uh, late last summer I think it was. My yeah. apologies to yeah, sorry, Biz. the family and friends and the spirit of the Biz. Nobody beats the Biz. I am sorry. Um. So I don't know if we've t- <laughs> properly teased our side B at all. No. Um, but I mean, this is when a unique we come thing back, we're trying. Yeah. So we're going to try to rank some stuff because it's fun to rank things. And we usually don't like to do that necessarily. But maybe this is a good one to do. Um, we are going to talk yeah. about um, non-rock instruments in rock. In rock. So yes. anything that isn't normally associated with... Uh, necessarily with rock music but maybe has found its way into some of our favorite songs and mm-hmm. bands mm-hmm. and, and we'll, we'll lay out, out some ground rules are. yes yeah and i've i've normally shied away from picking favorites or trying to rank stuff but i'm gonna step outside of my comfort zone and make some decisions because i think that's ultimately what what it comes down to is like okay like make a final decision it's not yeah. life or death like you can rank something even if it's not just this set in stone thing that you're going to have to stick with for the rest of your life. (laughs) (laughs) So um, let's do it. Let's flip it over and we'll come back and um, explore the, uh, the non rocky side of uh, some rock and roll songs.
side B of our 24th episode of Retro Groove. And uh, trying a little bit uh, something new here, we're going to attempt to formulate a ranking of Mm -hmm. the top five instruments, non-rock instruments used in rock and roll. And um, this could be bands that have a permanent fixture of this instrument built into the band, or it could be, you know, they maybe use it once or twice. Um, But we're going to, we're going to attempt to rank these and we are going to come to a consensus. So help us. Mm. We're going to make it happen. Um, I know that me, me in particular, I'm notoriously like, I can't pick favorites. I can't pick a single favorite or a top five, but we're, we're going to do it. We're going to stretch ourselves and step outside of our comfort zones. That was particularly me. Um, but, um, there is kind of a long history of, uh, a lot of experimentation in rock music, you know, it was mm-hmm. kind of birthed out of experimentation. Um, you know, I'm, re- I'm reminded of like, um, <clears throat> early records of, uh, bands like the Sonics who would, um, distort their guitars by poking holes in the speakers of their amplifiers to get like a, mm-hmm. a ripped rattling sound. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of innovation and thinking outside the box that went into the formation of what we now know as rock and roll music. Um, and that includes, um, experimenting with other instruments. So, um, I think we, we decided pretty, pretty early on that we're going to exclude the turntable. Going to exclude the turntable. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's an instrument. It's an instrument for sure, and I feel like it's probably of the things that I I am voting to exclude. It's probably the hardest one to justify excluding because it it is still fairly recent. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But I think that it's not entirely in the nature of what we're trying to do with this ranking. So I think that's why I'm kind of leaning towards it. Like I I feel like this needs to be a little more expansive than what a turntable necessarily can do in this context, but it's not really um, a traditional instrument, I guess is what we're getting. So there's, there's that. It's also that it's kind of already been established as a rock and roll instrument or a staple of rock. You know what I mean? So, um, I feel like it's the right move to exclude that. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there's not necessarily any other ground rules. We're not, uh, saying that well, it has to be uh, a permanent part right. of the a group or um, anything like that, right? Yeah, um, we just want to see. We just want to see. We're going to discuss a few different instruments here. Compare their history in some of our favorite rock moments yeah. to see if one comes out above another or how we can kind of stack them to say like. You might not think of this as the most rocking thing, but here's some reasons why it actually kind of is very important to sure. rock music. Um, we're also going to leave out, I believe, any sort of key synth organ. I mean, it's just, it's been so ingrained in rock yeah. uh, since the 60s, really. Uh, and then piano even before that. Right. That, um, yeah, even the piano though almost every, birthed rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. So not only, not that it's in your everyday rock band, you know, your your guitar, bass, drums, but, um, it, you know, it's in so many of them now. So many of them have some sort of a key position or a key player. Yeah. Um, so going to leave that one out. Um, but I think I'm going to make this really easy on you, Adam, because I'm just going to come out and give you the number one here. Okay, all right. And then, <laughs> and then uh, we'll just have to dethrone it, uh, or see if we can dethrone it. Let's start and, there. Uh, and that's the accordion. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> uh, so the accordion. Uh, you know, I love Weird Al, but he's not in the conversation here. Um, 
But the accordion, I think, even though we are excluding a lot of key instruments, I would keep this one in because it is pretty distinctive. It's not yes. your run-of-the-mill key uh, instrument. And, you know, if you're in the indie rock space, then you're very familiar with it from They Might Be Giants, uh, Neutral Milk Hotel. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were in sort of the pop space, you know, you had Springsteen that's played it uh, or had had a, had a band member that played it, um, Bare Naked Ladies, uh, the Hooters, who I recently picked up their album. Uh, I remember going to see No Effects and Eric Melvin at a really? punk rock show is playing accordion quite often. Wow. Um, and then the Decemberists. I mean, I, I Decemberists. love, <laughs> love the Decemberists. And I feel like Bell and Sebastian might come up a few times uh, in this conversation, but uh, I'm pretty sure they have an probably as well. <laughs> yeah, and I think Sufjan Stevens too. I mean, there's a bunch of those like alt folk artists yeah. that kind of break this. Um, you know what else I just but, thought of too is Counting Crows probably has at least one or two oh, yeah. accordion. I, I can think of one in particular off the top of my head. Yeah. So yeah. that they're in there. So I feel like the accordion pretty dynamic across rock music. Um, so I like. It's such I a distinct sound, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it can go in a bunch of different ways, but that drone to it, um, I, I, it's very cool that it's in so many different types of yeah. music. You know, like uh, I think of, like I said, No Effects or Gogo Bordello. Um, like you can have it in this high energy punk music and it's like, mm-hmm. still it just, works. It rips and it rips. Um, but you can also have it as this like dirge and a sad folk hymn um, yeah. by the Decemberists. So, uh, yeah, accordion. I, I, I submit accordion. Is there something that you think is better uh, in rock music than the accordion? Well, you just, you just made a much stronger argument for the accordion than I thought was possible. <laughs> and... Uh, that's, which is awesome. Um, really unique instrument and definitely cuts through the mix and is very, very noticeable. Um, but also can blend well at the same time. Um, so, but I think if there's something else that cuts through the mix even better. It's a couple things that come to mind. One of them electronic and one of them not. Um, but let's, let's go with another kind of, you know, the accordion it's, it's a key based instrument, but the sound is created by the movement of, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the terminology of the parts, but it's still air being moved through the bellows, right. Moving through reeds. Yeah. So, I'm going to present the flute mm. as an instrument okay. that um, cuts through the mix, kind of sits on top of the mix, but can be a background staple of a sad song or a blazing rock and roll solo piece um, as it's often used in, in rock music. So of course, you know, you can't talk about the flute being used in rock music without Jethro Tull. It's just like, that's, that is the rock and roll flute band. Um, and you know, the flute, if you don't think of the flute as, um, an instrument that can rip, listen to some Jethro Tull and it will prove you wrong very, very quickly. Right. Um, but we've got a, a number of other groups, uh, including a lot of, prog rock groups like Genesis and King Crimson um, Mm -hmm. that have a lot of that going on. Um, It's in at least one or two Beatles songs. Um, You've got, uh, oh, and and Heart, you know, you've got um, uh, Ann Gibson from Heart playing the flute on a number of tracks, including um, one that I can think of off the top of my head, a very uh, Jethro Tull-esque flute solo on their debut album. Um, the name of the song is escaping me, but, um, it's, it's a straight up rock and roll song. Um, I think it's sing child. I think that's the name of the song. 
um, but like a full on rock and roll solo. And it's, it's on the flute. Um, you know, and it goes all the way back to some of the more folk pop artists like the mamas and the papas in the sixties. Yeah. California and, dreaming. Mm-hmm. So some iconic mm-hmm. songs, it's an iconic sound. It's an instantly recognizable sound. It's definitely not something that you would think of if someone just mentions the flute as a rock and roll instrument, but yeah. has been incorporated into so much rock music that um, it's, you know, maybe not so much in the modern sphere of rock music, but certainly um, in the, you know, classic rock into the folk rock and the prog rock of the late 70s and early 80s, for sure. Yeah, my uh, my mom was very into the moody blues when I was growing oh, yes. up and this mm-hmm. a bunch of flute in uh in There's another blues one for sure, yeah. Um and I also think I think of uh the men at work song <laughs> down under. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> I could like if I'm trying to like imagine hearing flute in a in a song in like a contemporary contemporary pop song or whatever yeah, it is quote, rock unquote. song mm-hmm. i it do works. think of i do think of down under where it's like that kookaburra Absolutely. i know there was like a whole lawsuit over that but yes. yeah i think of the little We've talked about that yeah yeah so um, it i think it works it does it's it's a tough stance right like when True. you're standing on stage rocking while holding the flute you really gotta like work your shoulders into it um, although the accordion is also very cumbersome, so I, I think they're probably like equally tough to represent in a cool rocking way right. on stage. Um, and I would say that another instrument that is also pretty difficult to represent in a rocking way is the violin. Uh, True. The violin, the violin, I think, is uh, a big time contender. In this conversation as well it is it is it's going to be a back top to mm-hmm. yeah you go all the way back to like velvet underground that that early velvet underground had a bunch in there mm-hmm. um and then you come to your arcade fires your dave matthews bands mm-hmm. um kansas uh you had the the punk rock again you had arcade fire uh you had yellow card and and flogging molly oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um i mean when i went to go see jason isbell granted that's country but uh went to go see him a couple weeks ago and it was him and his wife amanda on on uh on fiddle you mm-hmm. know yeah um, definitely fits into even... that americana alt country thing yeah. um of course yeah. but that definitely bleeds over um yeah with um a, a lot of the um uh kind of crossover between that alt country americana and the kind of folk rock that we have today so there's there's definitely yeah. um some crossover there some bleed in yeah I wanted to make the argument for the cello, but I couldn't really find a whole lot. I just like the cello um, yeah <laughs> so but I do think that there's uh like apocalyptica on the mm-hmm. harder rock side and the avit brothers on the folk like alt folk side um yeah i just think strings in general I, i'll leave it at violin i don't think we need to do an expansive like strings thing but um having that sort of like violin viola cello aspect to your mm-hmm. music is something really special um it really it does give it a a, a unique kind of sound yeah you know you have a lot of string instruments already in a band but right the bow the bowed strings if you will um it's a very different just, sound yeah they feel really good uh in the right settings well sure. and you've got so you've got a cello player on the nirvana unplugged album Mm -hmm. Uh, playing throughout you know um and then you've got stuff that you wouldn't think would work like like electric light orchestra where you've got like a you know string section practically um if you know your band has a full-time cello player and violin player um and that's kind of a unique sphere but i mean elo is still going strong so um there's there's at least uh that you know, model to, to go after. And there's, there's a lot of rock groups that, um, they'll either 
team up with the local symphony orchestra or they'll have oh, a man. small section that comes with them. You know what I mean? I mean if they're that's doing what the Who's a big doing tour, right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, even Weird yeah. Al did it. So yeah. you got um, that, that, um, that classic just string section thing where you've got different types of, of bowed string instruments um, having their own sections and playing different parts that can lend itself to pretty much any style of music if done correctly. Um, and it can, it can just add so much depth and emotion to a song that may already have a lot of depth and emotion to it. So strong contender for the violin slash, you know, stringed instrument section. That's going to be up there for sure. That, that could very, very well be number two, number three. Um, I still, man, you made such a good argument for the accordion. I'm like struggling. Ah! (laughs) Like, like how is, how is that possible? Let's go to the horn section. Let's do that. That's going to be, that's also going to be a very strong contender. I got a hot take though on this, I think, which we will have to come to a consensus on because as I was delving into this, I had initially put trumpet, trombone, and saxophone all in one one category. Mm-hmm. And if we do that, I think it's going to take number one because the yeah. sax carries it. Like, there's a lot of brass that I love in music. Um, I think it's very strong, but I don't know if it's top five. But if you factor in the saxophone, you've got... Uh, Clarence Clemens, the E Street Band. You have mm-hmm. uh, Bowie and The Cure and the Stooges that used a bunch of sax over the years. And then you have people now like Kamasi Washington, who's just on St. Vincent albums and the new Florence album. Um, like wow. mm-hmm. the sax, the sax, like as blues kind of. Uh, especially like the like southern kind of New Orleans influence, like when you think Huey Lewis, you know, like when blues uh, ca- like came out again, uh, when rock showed its blues roots, I guess mm-hmm, you'll mm-hmm. say, um, it the the sax was just cool and sexy and yeah. like like it just kills it. Like there's just and if you want to talk about like the swagger on stage, man, yeah. like sax players got it. Whereas like you know, I've been to some ska shows. The trombone player can get down. Like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's about the only place the trombone player can get down. Yeah. Um, but, like, nobody swaggers like a sax player, man. You put those, like, uh, sunglasses on. Like, I'm try- <laughs> like, man. So, and then, there's something real sa- special about a sax player. I mean, and then it can do some unique stuff, too. Like, you look at bands like Morphine. And Mm -hmm. what the saxophone lends to, you know, where it's really just a trio. It's, it's that, that two string git bass and a drummer and the, the, um, I guess that would be what a baritone sax, like the the lower register saxophone. Um, it's, it's really unique and haunting at the same time. It's, it's, it, 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 it's a really versatile instrument. Um, yeah. So that's, <clears throat> and it's not really, it's so it, saxophone is so weird and unique because I think, is that technically a woodwind instrument? It is. Yeah, Cause it is. it's not, it's not a, so it's not, it's not a part of instrument. like the brass section. That's the thing is like, it can be in the brass section, but it's really a woodwind. Yeah. It's like more like a clarinet. Right. So yeah, it's almost like a hybrid yeah, because it can kind of yeah. fit in both spaces. So it's a it's a unique I, instrument. It it kind of deserves its own spot. I think it needs to. I feel like it needs to not. It can't be lumped in with the the trumpet and the trombone. And again, I like I like both of those instruments. I love ska. I grew up listening to a, right. a ton of ska. Definitely. Um, and so and I think of like. There's been fun songs with the trumpet. There's a bunch of Beatles songs with the trumpet, right? Yeah. Um, I feel like there's uh, a couple cake songs that have 
trumpet in them, right? I think oh, a trumpet, trumpet is a staple of cake. cake. I think it's yeah. in almost every song, isn't it? Is is it? Yeah. They have like and a dedicated trumpet player. I think they I think they do, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um and Paul Simon, a bunch of yes. a bunch of trumpet and, and Paul Simon things. But yeah, I keep coming back to Boss Tones and Goldfinger and Less Than Jake and like all the yeah, all for the sure. fun um ska stuff and like punk stuff that I listened to. Well yeah, that was a, a huge part section. of the late nineties, absolutely. Yeah. Um yeah. and then there's there's like this huge um like brass rock aspect of particularly in the seventies, you had bands like Chicago and Blood, mm. Sweat and Tears chase where it was like that was the the crux of the band is like the almost the whole band was like they had a guitar player and a bass player but it was like the brass section was center stage and like that was the sound of the band and you definitely don't have that anymore that's a very like 70s thing (laughs) but um and i don't know what where you know where you put that if that's like you know, brass section or whatever. But I, I, I don't think you can just overall lump saxophone into that. Yeah. I'm just looking to see, cause I, I, I thought of the, when you said Chicago, I started thinking of the Doobie brothers, but I feel like the Doobie brothers, it was mainly saxophone. <laughs> like yeah, I think, think so. Mm-hmm. I think it's mainly saxophone, man. That's yeah, so weird. And All in right. stuff, in think? stuff like Steely Dan too. You know what I mean? Steely so there, Dan. There's a lot yeah. where it's you know, um, it's not a full brass section. It's just primarily saxophone. And sax. isn't there a sax player in Dave Matthews Band as well? There, I'm not a Dave is, Matthews fan, but there is what well, there's. The, I mean, there there's a. I've seen some music a videos. <laughs> or, I mean, Boyd Tinsley used to be in the band. He was the violinist. Um, and then yeah, there is a sax player it's as like a permanent staple. Yeah. It's Leroy. What I mean. Leroy. Yeah. But I don't think he's in the band anymore. They've gone through a few personnel changes. Um, with yeah. that many people. I'm oh sure. no, he passed. Sorry. I just, Oh, that's right. He, I knew one, away. one right. of the key members passed not yep. too long ago. I do remember he, that. He passed away. Uh, yeah. Leroy Moore. Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah, have have had a uh, have had a consistent sax player. With so them, saxophone sure. is up there, like that's. Yeah, I think sax is 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 up there for sure. Oh yeah, Jeff Coffin is the one. I that I do know Jeff Coffin. Um, he's their sax player now. So yeah, I feel like sax is is gonna fight for that top it's, five spot it's, too. It's somewhere. there. It's definitely yeah. in in the top five. Uh, yeah. without a doubt. Um, we we talked about violin. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if there's too much more to say about the violin on its own. Um, <clears throat> there's there's a couple more that are going to be outliers here, but we're definitely going to you know have to fill in a yep. you know fourth or fifth spot here. So yeah. there's a couple that stood out to me as some of my favorite um, non rock instruments, if you want to call it that. But uh-huh. um, one that keeps coming up time and time again is the theremin. And so for those that don't know, the theremin is a weird semi like electronic instrument that mm-hmm. um, is kind of just activated, but it's like a rod that's activated by waving your hand. It's a very kind of ghostly um, electronic kind of sound. Um, but it goes all the way back to, you know, the beach boys in good vibrations. Um, and you know, the white stripes have used theremin broken bells, the pixies. Um, so it's, it's a very, very strange and one of the more unique instruments, especially since it's probably, it's the only instrument that I can think of where you're not making any physical contact with the instrument itself. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. Yeah, don't touch it. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I don't yeah. know what happens. Other than if a you microphone, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but I think it deserves to. And it's so funny in in doing the research with this. For the longest time, I was like, "Oh, I got to talk about the theremin because of Portishead." Mm. But in my research, it's like, "Oh, they never, they didn't." And and this was a fact in my head for the longest time. When I when I think theremin, I think of Portishead. But mm-hmm. it, but in those songs that it sounds like a Portishead, it's a sample or a record. 
it, they never actually like use the instrument. It wasn't even like a synth or something like that. You said it was a sample. I think it was a sample. Wow. So yeah, they so that boop that 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 busted my the, a fact that's been in my head for twenty something years <laughs> that that was yeah. an instrument that they actually used. So that knocked down the theremin a peg for me, (laughs) but, um, I definitely, it definitely deserves to be talked about. It's a unique electronic instrument, um, that could, that could have a number of different applications from soundtrack to classical to, you know, avant-garde music, uh, to rock and roll. Um, so there is that. Yeah. Um, I think, I think I'd like to toss out banjo and i i feel like you could also bring the mandolin into this although i I didn't think of as many mandolin um examples as as i did banjo Mm -hmm. um but i feel like obviously we had that like lumineers mumford and sons folk revival thing that happened um which was big um, it was big you had something you had it (laughs) (laughs) uh but you definitely had it before that too um you know i i remember the the eagles like growing up with the eagles Mm -hmm. um there's a bunch of banjo in that um there were who songs zeppelin neil young i mean like a bunch of a bunch of really great uh banjo pieces throughout Mm -hmm. uh throughout kind of rock history um and again counting crows have a guy who plays the banjo pretty frequently Mm -hmm. um yeah, there's been some. There was a contemporary pop band called Judah and the Lion who right, had two right. hits a couple a couple years ago, and they've got a designated banjo player. So you know, it's it's in that guitar family. Um, it obviously sonically is is a bit different, and I think provides like uh, a cool kind of twangy texture point. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's super dynamic. No, so, like it probably doesn't necessarily fit in what should be the top five here which i think could just span so many different right yeah genres. banjo is kind of a one trick pony instrument yeah for lack of a but better it's very term. impressive yeah but it, oh like, it's yeah difficult it, yeah seeing it performed is always kind of like there's a wow factor for me for sure yeah and you had well rem definitely had some mandolin work so mm-hmm. there 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 were you know, modern groups using the mandolin. Um, and I don't know if that deserves to be lumped in with banjo or not, but in, in that, that like, yeah, it's that blue grassy kind of leaning, like the folk, the folk stringed instruments really. But Um, you know, you, it, they don't, they have kind of, it's not a versatile sound. mm -mm. They have their place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas, you know, instruments like saxophone and even violin mm-hmm. um, and and uh, the accordion, you can you can fit them and weave them into different yeah. energies, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is what just I'm like the bagpipes. At. We could do that with the bagpipes, too, right? Okay. Do you want to <laughs> just fit the... <laughs> Let's okay. Get it out of the way, Liam. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the back. Well, I got some honorable mentions too, so it's worth. I'm a bagpiper. I got to shout it out. Let's do it. Play the bagpipes. All right. um, It's a it's a worthy instrument to talk about for sure. Yeah. So when I was uh, learning to play the bagpipes, it was like a family kind of thing, right? And uh, you know, wearing as I would assume it typically is, (laughs) rather yeah, (laughs) rather than the kid's first choice. Yeah, wearing a kilt and playing a funky instrument and marching around in it is not when you're like 13 or 14, not just your inclination uh necessarily. <laughs> right. But but fortunately, I was doing that as uh Corn and Dropkick Murphys and the Pogues, you had a bunch of and Flogging mm. Molly, like you had these bands that 
uh, had come out and were playing bagpipes in a mm-hmm. cool way. And so I didn't have to break ground and make them cool. There you go. Because was like some hard rock, cool punk stuff right. that was bagpiping. Mm-hmm. Um, and it all culminated in me playing the bagpipes at my high school ba- Battle of the Bands. Nice. And, uh, I need yeah, to hear was, this story. pretty rad. <laughs> uh, well, so I had a... We had a band and we played Green Day covers and stuff. And then we closed uh, the show with Amazing Grace, but like rock style. Where Yo. I just, yeah, I just ripped <laughs> into so it cool. with my band behind me. It was really fun. Because I would imagine um, Amazing Grace is like, that's like one of the first things that you yeah. learn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, always, I always that. hear that. That's like the. Yeah. I feel That's like I could song. probably yeah. pick up the bagpipes and work out amazing. You totally could. Yeah, yeah. It's not that tricky. Um, so just just a cool shout out there. Like again, I didn't think when I was learning it, I was like, man, I'm gonna have to hide this from everyone. And then like I got, you know, I, people thought it was pretty sweet. Cool. You're like marching up and down for St. Patrick's Day and everyone's cheering for you. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Nice. <laughs> um, so I don't think it's a top five, uh, not very dynamic. Um, tough to do a rock and roll stance with the bagpipes. I tried, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it is, uh, it is, it is, it, it rips. Could be it's top got 10. that, it's got that drone thing that the accordion's got. Yeah. The drone. It. It's just not as versatile, but it's that kind of like funky drone thing that carries you through as you're being all dynamic. So can um, you, um, can you change the tone? I know mm-hmm. next to nothing about playing yeah. the bagpipes. So you can, so you can change the, the key or the, the note a of bit. the drone. Yeah. Yeah. A bit. I okay. mean, there's, there's only so much that you can mess around with it. Um, so it's really fine tuning, but you can mess with the reeds that are inside each stock of the bag and, uh, and you can manipulate it a little bit. Okay. So it's not just that yeah. one note that's going to be the drone all the time. You Correct. could have a different yeah, note. Okay. It. Yeah. Okay. So that makes it a little bit more to where you could yeah. fit it into a song and not have, you know, the whole band have to change the key right. of what they're doing around the the bagpipe. Yeah, they're a funky key. Yeah, it's like a, <laughs> it's like a weird B flat thing. Yeah. Oh man, weird yeah. stuff. Yeah. I hate getting into that like it's like I've been playing music for close to 30 years now and it's like I the music theory just blows my mind to this very yeah. day. I know like the absolute basics and anything beyond that, it's like, nope, I guess I yeah. can't do it. Well, it's when crazy. we performed it, like I tuned them down to my band's like standard um there you go. A A. Like I tuned everything down to their A so that it sounded right because otherwise we would have spent the entire five song set or whatever playing up to yeah. what the bagpipes were gonna be. Um, so yeah, the, you, you can manipulate it a little bit. Yeah. Cool. Very cool though. Um, you have another honorable mention? Um, I have another one that came up. That's not necessarily see my honorable, but the ones that I picked for like kind of an honorable mention are more like weird outliers that I just kind of okay. wanted to talk about briefly. Yeah. Um, but one that I did want to talk about that I don't think is going to make the top five, but might possibly make a top 10 if we tried to do that Mm -hmm. um is the harpsichord um i know it's a keyed instrument but i feel like it's unique in that it is a more of a like a baroque era instrument yeah for those that don't know it's it's a it's a keyboard that basically looks like a piano but rather than hammers striking the strings they're they're being plucked so it's got a very bright, plucky sound to it. Um, so you have the Black Keys using it on a song uh, at least once that I know of. Uh, you've got Damon Albarn from Blur playing it on an early Blur song. Um, R.E.M. has used it. Uh, Vampire Weekend famously used it on, um, I, not their most recent, but I think the prior one album that they put out. Um, I know Tori Amos has used the harpsichord. So, I mean, talk about an instrument that is very like specific in how it sounds and can't necessarily, I mean, you could, you could try, but it, it really similar to the banjo. It's just so bright and 
twangy might not necessarily be the right word for the harpsichord, but it's just very tinny and bright and high end. And there's not really much that you can do to, to muffle that or to change that in the context of playing with other instruments. But it's been used enough throughout, you know, pop and rock and roll history that I think it deserved to be talked about. Um, but yeah, with all the other stuff that we've gone into, there's no way it's going to make a top five. Um, yeah, but I do think of Piggies like on the White Album. Yeah. I always go back to that song. I remember the first time I heard it and it was so <laughs> weird. And I'm like, what is this song that I'm listening to? Oh my gosh. Um, but I think that there's harpsichord on that. That's like, like again, half the Beatles like songs the first time you hear it. Yeah. <laughs> it's that's like, true. what are that's they fair. doing now? Yeah. Um, I feel like Beach Boys, I feel like there were a bunch of Beatles and Beach Boys uh, songs that had uh, that had harpsichord. Yeah, I think those albums where they're just trying to use as many instruments as humanly possible. Yeah, I mean, I feel like Pet Sounds probably. I, it's got to sure. be on, throughout Pet Sounds. Um, it's, it's hard to tell it sometimes up against organs. Like, there's certain types of, I'm thinking of certain Doors songs where I'm like, it's probably an organ, but it feels like maybe it could have been a harpsichord. Yeah, I actually... He, he always played an organ, left, so I don't know. Left uh, the doors off because I wasn't able to like research deeply enough to find out if it was actually a harpsichord or if it was yeah. like a... Uh, what do they call it? Like a clav, clavicle um, organ keyboard thing, which is like, that's a weird hybrid instrument. Where it's like, is it a, uh, so I, I wasn't able, at least in the, I didn't research harpsichord for too long because I knew it was worth mentioning, but I was like, it's not going to make the top five. So I'm not going to yeah. like take a whole oh, no, lot this, of time to research this. This says that Manzarek played harpsichord a okay, bunch okay, cool. for a studio recording. So, I mean, he, he, it's not an instrument road, you take on the road. No, <laughs> yeah, no, no. He was just playing an organ on the road, but, uh, and an electric piano, but yeah, no, that, um, I can't imagine yeah. the pain in the butt. It would be to keep, a harpsichord wow. tuned on the road dude when i saw florence so florence always tours with a harp like a proper uh, yeah harp, a full-blown harp which, right mm -hmm. and i'm like how do you keep I that can't imagine tune? it's so many strings it's so crazy it's Jeez. so big yeah um, i'm always impressed by a harp harpist oh man when i yeah, see one like sure. at a, either a wedding or on a video it's like how a unique talent yeah crazy <laughs> Insane. We did not put the harp on. Um, no, on here. I couldn't think of enough examples. <laughs> but yeah. that's an impressive instrument. Um, yeah. But also one that's just very, very specific in how it sounds and probably wouldn't lend itself well to rock music or, yeah. you know, a lot of diverse um, instrumentation. All right. So I, I feel like we're getting into the second phase of this here, which is going to yeah. be okay. We've talked about some things. I've got a couple of silly honorable mentions. You know, the Trogs had a song using the ocarina and um, Neutral Milk Hotel used the saw blade. So those are definitely not going to make the top five and they're certainly probably wouldn't even make a top 10. Um, but moving on from mentioning instruments and, and talking about their impact, I think we can probably start to get into hashing out some order here. Yeah, although I just had a late breaking uh, thing in my head dun, dun, that dun. I'm wondering. Yeah, that I'm trying to think Go through for now. It. Just because we talked about harpsichord and we talked about the harp, and I was like, "Let's do it." What is it? Not the mouth. What about the mouth harp? Like, oh, what, uh, <laughs> harmonica. Like a harmonica. Yeah, it does probably count that's I very think. classic and, we missed we kind of uh, missed that because you got you know you got neil young you got blues traveler Stevie Wonder, got uh, Beatles, yeah a lot of a lot of uh harmonica mouth harp whatever you want to call it yeah i hadn't factored in the harmonica that one escaped as me as well this. Yeah. that's that's kind of up there that's, that's almost like, like a but like that's kind of a blues rock instrument though it is yeah yeah i don't know if we count it I feel like it's so rocking that maybe it shouldn't be on the list. Like, cause I feel like they just bust it. Like Springsteen just busts it out, you know, like, like Neil Young just busts out a harmonica. Like, I don't, 
That's a folk rock, blues rock instrument for yeah. sure. So I don't think right. I don't think yeah, that fits it. in the context of a non yeah, rock and roll instrument. But I agree. good call because I didn't even yeah. really and maybe in my brain it was always like that. So yeah. <clears throat> maybe that's why neither of us thought of it until, yeah. <laughs> until you thought of it just now. Yeah. Um, you said mouth harp, and I thought you were talking about like the twang, twang, twingy, twang, wow, twang, wow. You know, whatever that thing's called. It was the most important uh, <laughs> instrument. I used ever. to have one of those. I got it at a no. gift shop somewhere. <laughs> Isn't that called a mouth harp? What is that thing called? Uh, I think there's also a terrible name for it that I won't be saying, but uh, I think that there's, uh, you could call it just a, a jaw harp. A jaw harp. They, well, yeah. I, I used to have one. Yeah. I, I think used, you can call it a, a mouth harp too. One we haven't yeah. mentioned that also is probably like a silly quick honorable mention and I actually also used to have one of these is the didgeridoo. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so I If you've can't, been to Bonnaroo, you've probably seen someone play the didgeridoo. <laughs> <laughs> I never could get the circular breathing thing down to get the continuous drone going, but I did mm. own one. Um I don't remember why I had one or where it came from, yeah. but I, I had a bunch of weird instruments lying yeah. around. Um, so there's, there's the didgeridoo. That's a thing. I can't think of any, there must be like an incubus song with the didgeridoo in it somewhere. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a fish song or something too. Like, yeah, gotta be. Yeah. Okay. So I think we, let's try for a top five here. I, th- I think we have our five, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So like, I have it as accordion, flute, violin, sax, and then brass will put as trumpet, trombone. It has to be. Does that um, sound right? Okay. We it, just gotta it, order it really has things. to be. And yeah. I'm still kind of floored at what a strong argument that you came right out of the gate with for the accordion. <laughs> I mean, accordion is just It's so versatile. Fantastic. It is. I never would have thought of it as an versatile instrument, but the more I think about it... Yeah, I I may contradict myself, though, because the sax... For me, the fight for number one is between the sax and the accordion. I mean, you could almost argue that the sax is a rock and roll instrument. Like, you could make that argument... Which is it's why I think it needs to be at number one. Like I feel like it it's synonymous in enough spaces, but it's also not a rock instrument. It's a jazz instrument, right? Yeah. Um, it it's it a reed really, instrument. Yeah. It really it I feel like it epitomizes in many ways what we were kind of going for with this list of like mm-hmm. what's a th- what's a thing that if you saw someone playing it on the street probably not the rock uh, vibe that you're looking for, but when it's played in other contexts, it's just a banger. And like, I don't know, man, it's just, it's, it's across so many different iconic uh, moments in rock that I'm kind of talking myself out of accordion at number one. I feel like, (laughs) I feel like I'm leaning towards sex at number one. I don't know. I mean, just the fact that, you could make the argument that the saxophone is a rock and roll instrument and it's so tied to the blues, Mm -hmm. which is the, you know, the DNA that rock and roll is made of that it, it probably has to be saxophone for number one. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to list it as number one for right now. Yeah, let's do that. And I honestly can't really see anything dethroning that at this point. Like I'm, yeah. I'm not a huge sax guy, but I think it has to be there. It's it's. I feel like Clarence Clemens seals the deal for me. And again, I'm not. The, we know my history with Springsteen, <laughs> but like Clarence <laughs> Clemens is the coolest freaking dude. And like, I'm even thinking just, about more modern groups where they've used it in such an in- interesting way. Like yeah, you know, like I already, I mentioned Morphine, but but groups like like Ghost Funk Orchestra um, that use it and to such an amazing effect. And it's just, it's, it's very versatile. It's, 
Yeah. It's it's one of like the more versatile instruments on this list. So it's deserving. Like there's a bunch of bands, and Wolfpack is the one that's coming to mind for me, although I don't know if they actually, I think they have a sax player. There's a lot of those bands in that sort of new Pseudo funk, funk. Mm-hmm. alt funk, yeah, that just that have this amalgam of sounds, but they always need a sax player for yeah, what they're trying to definitely. do. Definitely. Um, that what's that so, yeah, band so called? I feel like I feel like um, sax has got to be. I can never uh, remember. Um, it's that group that's like twenty something members, very jazzy. Um, twenty members. The only band it's that like I'm a lot. Of that has polyphonic spree is the one. There's the group that I think of that has a no. It's like members. it's like instrumental. It's like twenty like. It's a lot of people. Why am I, man, I'm blanking on it. I'm hitting that wall again. Like I can see them (laughs) playing and I can see the music video and it's some like 20 people playing music. Yes. And they've all got headphones on and like, they're playing this really complex jazzy, funky rock hybrid. Um, Darn it. It's like two words. (laughs) What's it called? <laughs> I'm I'm gonna have to try to look this up. Talk That's amongst fine. yourselves while I look this yeah. up because it's gonna well, bother so, me until I so do. So after that, after that, my gut goes to the accordion. I just feel like, like it, as we've talked about in so many different sort of side or sub genres of rock, it it has been able to kind of pervade. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, when I think about Counting Crows. Um, when I think about indie rock, like the indie folk scene, um, yeah, no, I feel like the accordion is, 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 is pretty badass. And I think there's a part of me that looks at it like the banjo where there is, um, a novelty to mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, a but little bit. it has, but it's dynamic enough where it carries it beyond the banjo for me. Yeah, it's um, definitely more versatile than the banjo, that's for sure. So It's definitely we, number 2 or number 3. I was going to say so is is it is it slugging it out against violin for you? For, it definitely or brass, is. Or okay. Um the band that I couldn't think of the name of was Snarky Puppy, by the way. Oh, okay, my, Snarky Puppy. My brain wanted to say Skinny Puppy, and I was like, it's definitely not Skinny Puppy. I know who that no. is. <laughs> but yeah, they're like a uh tw- 19 20 something member band um well over 40 musicians have come in and out they've got like 14 albums um it yeah, lists skinny puppy is something else right skinny puppy yeah. is like some i don't know some weird industrial band or something something like that yeah um <clears throat> snarky puppy it was yeah snarky puppy is what i couldn't think of um anyway we were talking about accordion and it's place. Well, I was saying, is it, is it, yeah, is it fighting for second place against violin for you or for, or brass or flute? I feel like. <sighs> See, when we put it up against violin, it gets tricky. Yeah. Because as. There's a lot of great violin. It, there's so much violin used in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I can't. I mean, you mentioned a band, but I can't think of. I'm trying to think of how many different applications it really has. And yeah, it works well for those slow, sad, like Decemberist type songs. Um, I, you know, there's not a lot of like fast rock music that I could see it working in. Yeah. And violin, you know, when, or fiddle, whichever way you want to go mm-hmm. with it. You know, you've got not only the like Americana crossover, but you know, you've got stuff where you wouldn't think it would work like the pop punk stuff, like, like yellow card. Yeah. So it, it works and it also works in a slow ballad, emotional type of, Oh Yeah. Uh, song as well. So yeah, I feel like I feel like number two almost has to be violin. 
Yeah, you're probably right. I mean, violin is also an instrument. There's this um, lady, Lindsay Sterling, who is like the like dynamic rock uh, like violinist. Actually, no, I think there's uh, Orient. Oh, no, she's a guitar player. But there's another violinist who plays like in metal bands a bunch too. Um, but Lindsey Sterling is like, I mean, she's done stuff with like Pentatonix and mm-hmm. I think like Imagine Dragons and stuff. Like she's done uh, Evanescence. Um, she, she's like, she's somebody who's got that kind of swagger and can like, come in and just like rip and riff on the violin. And I feel like to your point, the fact that she can do that means that the violin probably has that ability, you know, like has that it like part of it is her ability and the others that we've talked about, like Boyd Tinsley from Dave Matthews band. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, you've got to have the right instrument to yeah. get up on stage like you're not doing that with a triangle you know like you're <laughs> right. like you're right. like it's the right instrument and then she takes it up there and rips it to shreds <laughs> so um so yeah so i i could i could get with that so we put violin at two accordion at three tentatively yeah yeah and then oh, so but accordion's flute, going up against it's flute and brass some heavy hitters though right yeah so like I don't know. For me, flute is probably at the bottom of the five. Like, I think it stays in the five, obviously, but I do think that its place is important in certain areas, but I don't see it um, in as many right. different subgenres as we're talking about here. And it hasn't so carried me, over. You know what I mean? Like, right. it was used a lot in some of these prog rock groups i mean you saw it Mm. in like the folk rock in the 60s and leading into the more experimental stuff and the prog rock of the late 70s early 80s with with like you know heart and king crimson and and genesis and stuff like that but and jethro tull of course but it didn't really go beyond that like what what band can you think of in the last 20 years that has used a flute yeah and i'm sure someone could prove us wrong and name something yeah i'm sure it's like yeah I, yeah. I, nothing prominent, nothing that was that was popular. Yeah. So I think for that reason alone, it's gonna get knocked down. Yeah. Um, below, you know, saxophone and brass. Yeah. Um, the hard so the hard one's gonna be like, where do we play sax versus the brass, actual brass? Oh, uh, okay, got it for the third and fourth place spot here. Yeah. yeah. Cause this is look, well, it's looking pretty good and I don't really have any compelling argument to change our number one or number two spot. Right. But I definitely think that flute is not going to be ranked above either saxophone or brass. So that kind of leaves no. us with deciding saying, where does- those two end up. Right. And so then you you say potentially brass at three, flute at four, accordion at five? No, I th- I, th- I thought we okay. were pretty... Oh, okay. Hold on. So where are we at right now? We've got... I have sax at one, sax violin at one, and at violin two. at two. Okay. Yeah. So we've got three, four, and five as... Accordion, accordion brass, and brass flute. and flute. But we've got saxophone too. Does brass too. go to three? Well, so sax is number one. Oh, sax is number one. <laughs> God, yeah. Stupid. yeah, I got you. I'm blaming it on COVID brain. I'm uh, yeah. that's what I'm blaming it on. It's all good. Okay, so we're deciding not between like, saxophone and brass, but no. between accordion, accordion and, and brass, brass, basically. So, with obviously, I think they're both versatile, but seeing, you know, you've got the brass rock of the '70s. Mm-hmm. You've got brass being used in a lot of like the late nineties, early two thousands alternative music with like the whole, uh, neutral milk hotel, apples in stereo, um, Beulah thing, you know, kind of that Beatles worship kind of, uh, scene 
<clears throat> that they were all kind of related and played on each other's albums and stuff like that. But that was really big in the late yeah. nine, 90s, early 2000s. Um, and, you know, S- ska hasn't, and and reggae hasn't really gone away. It's just like mm-hmm. not the big, like super popular teenage sensation that it was in the late 90s. Yeah. Um, so the, the brass section is still, a, and you've always got, you know, the, the large ensemble groups that we've talked about, like, like ghost funk orchestra and snarky puppy and stuff like that. So I think the brass section really lives on. Um, whereas I'm not too sure that the accordion has that same kind of staying power. We saw some '90s groups use it, um, but it, I don't feel like it's 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 in a decline or has been in a decline for the last twenty years or so. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm for that reason I'm thinking that the brass section is gonna outrank the accordion. Yeah, you're probably right. I think I think I think especially when you think to uh something like chicago like it mm-hmm. it has been it has been in so many different important um moments throughout rock whereas accordion has kind of had some highlights here or there but a- as a whole if we're talking about both something that's dynamic but also that is like ingrained in the identity or history of rock without being a quote unquote rock instrument. It's a, you know, trumpet trombone combo is, it's pretty important. Yeah. Agreed. So yeah. where we stand right now is saxophone at number one. Yep. Right. Violin at mm-hmm. number two. Mm-hmm. Um, brass section, meaning, you know, trombone, trumpet, or any combination of those at number three. Um, cause you've got bands like, like we mentioned, like cake, or you've got the one trumpet player and it works in the context yep. of the group. I'm not sure of any band that has just a trombone player, but there, maybe there is out there. Who knows? Huh. Yeah. And then we've got accordion at number four. Yep. And flute at number five. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with this list. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just checking myself to make sure that, there's no um, angles that I'm not thinking of or, or mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, harmonicas in the wing. See, I, I feel like the harmonica is or harp or whatever you want to call it is totally a rock blues yeah. rock instrument. No, I agree. Cause what, I mean, what other, where else is it used? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it would, uh, just like any sort of key organ thing, like it would automatically jump to the top of this list for a reason, whereas saxophone... It's a rock instrument. Yeah, saxophone isn't the immediate answer, but it as you look at it, it's yeah. the right answer. I mean, even so, the piano, yeah. like where was rock and roll birthed? Little Richard, yeah. Jerry Lee Lewis, um, right. Bill Haley. It's like they played the piano. Yeah. Right? Am I wrong? Like yeah. that's... No, the, that no, you're piano, totally right. It's like... Didn't Bill, Bill? I'm having another like little brain fart moment, but Bill Haley played the piano, right? So I believe so, yeah. That I mean, that is like the, f- and then of course, you know, it's birthed out of the blues. But if we're talking about rock and roll, and you know, the blues as its earlier predecessor, you've got you know, piano and guitar and harmonica at the root of that. So I, I don't think we can count piano or, you know, the organs that were so popular in, in rock music right. coming up through the sixties and seventies. Those are staple rock and roll instruments. Uh, and then into the synthesizers, it's like, you know, clearly a rock and roll instrument. So yeah. I'm very happy with this yeah. list. No, I think we're good with this list. I don't think this there's a strong argument for changing anything. <clears throat> and I think we did it. Yeah. All right. We did our first list. We were and we didn't, we weren't, uh, there were no disagreements that anyone had to concede or come to a 
compromise on. So we pretty much landed. Well, we'll fight about the bagpipes later. But that's <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am pretty. I did play the saxophone in in middle school, so I'm happy oh, about that. Wait, I hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> that did not play oh, that's into it. Number one. I will oh, say, man. in all fairness, I did not enjoy the saxophone, and I did not uh, continue it after my second year. Oh, okay. I did not enjoy playing. It hurt my my cheeks. Yeah. To play it. Yeah. I I put Easy down the saxophone and picked up a guitar. A hundred percent. Yeah. Build those calluses on your fingers. Yeah, that was easier than like trying to build up. Catch my muscles. breath. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. Yeah, my mouth would constantly hurt. It was like, yeah, no matter how, and I played it like religiously. I practiced every single day for like two years, and it never Jeez. got any easier. <laughs> it, my mouth just hurt every single time. Yeah. So I was like, no, forget this. Yeah, um, and yeah, I got pretty I definitely decent had that too. With the bagpipes too. Oh, really? Um, yeah, but like the one neat thing that came out of that though, is I feel like a year or two in of playing the bagpipes, I could also whistle all of a sudden. Like I feel like I got my lip muscles oh. set in a certain way where I like suddenly learned how to whistle. Um, so that was cool. Like I didn't even try to really learn how to whistle. And then my mouth was just able to do it from playing a wind instrument. So then, and I, again, I've never touched a bagpipe in my life. Mm. So are you, is there any like rhythmic aspect to how you need to breathe or are you literally just bit. making sure the bag stays full? A little bit, uh, not to get too deep in the weeds, but like when you get to like competition level, uh, whatever, um, like they listen for your, your balance of like, like if you squeeze and are blowing out of rhythm with itself, the pitch can kind of waver a little oh, bit because the airflow yes. isn't, isn't steady. I can see that. So you really need to have like a cadence between like when you're blowing in and when you're squeezing. And if you're not balancing that rhythm, it can kind of waver a little bit. I can see that. No, most people, I mean, if you're at a funeral, you're not paying attention to that anyway. But um, but yeah, like it is something that, that comes into play. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, there you cool. Go. There's your bagpipe facts, guys. Little bagpipe fact of the day. <laughs> it's a really interesting concept to me. Um, yeah. But there's our top five. We got it. Yeah. Bagpipes are number six easily. Mm, or yeah, in, they're probably like yeah. <laughs> yeah. In competition with with the flute at number five. Yeah, maybe. How about that? We'll split. Yeah, we'll split fine. it. I'll pretend it's six. Number six. <laughs> <laughs> Number five is flute slash bagpipes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There's our top five cool. non-rock instruments in rock music. And uh, I think this is a fun uh, format. Yeah. Uh, definitely we'll something that we'll pick up with. I know we've got, we, we knocked around a number of ideas uh, mm -hmm. for these types of episodes. Um, so definitely something we can come back to. Um, uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, yeah, me too. I think that we could do a lot of these, um, <clears throat> on a number of different, uh, topics. So and it'd, it'd be fun too, to bring in a guest, um, to, to, you know, throw in, uh, a, a third set of opinions and, and yeah. have a, have like a tiebreaker, uh, opinion in case we ever come up against some, you know, disagreement where we, we, you know, we can't just flip a coin. Um, that, that might be fun as well. Um, but that's it. That's our, that's our top five and hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, Liam, do you have any final words other than our, no. our fun little, uh, uh, I enjoyed the, the little bagpipe mini <laughs> lesson. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> I've honestly always been curious. To, uh, yeah. it's, it's just, you know, one of those, since I've never played it, and it's such a kind of a unique instrument, it's always had kind of a mystery around it, similar to the theremin for me, because I've never, like, gotten to use or play with a theremin. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely something I want to check out. So, you know, if I ever see a set of bagpipes 
at a second hand yeah. store somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might pick it up. Should be on the lookout for the Irish bagpipes, which are different from the ones that we're talking about. Because the Irish ones you don't blow into. You uh, you squeeze with one. You have like a bellows under one hand really? and a bag under the other. So you kind of like do like a chicken dance thing um that's interesting yeah so look those up those are you don't have to worry about your lips then you just learn how to balance your your wings back and forth (laughs) um but i've got a set of those i haven't really messed with them much my dad played them a little um but uh at some point i'll pick those up too they're fun that's not as loud which is nice oh not as yeah that's good for practice so you're not (laughs) you're not waking up the neighbors with the exactly with the funeral church (laughs) or with amazing grace (laughs) yeah (laughs) awesome well thank you liam for hashing this out with me and thank you listener for listening to retro groove we are part of the retro logic network you can find us on discord on the retro logic server you can also find us on Twitter at RetroGroove underscore pod and on Instagram at RetroGroove underscore podcast. Thank you for listening and have an awesome weekend. Adios. Adios.